It is good to be with family again. I am grateful to the Lord for all the doors he's opened. Um, seeing his work in different churches around Quebec, it's amazing. But again, it's good to be home with my snowy family. And um, once again, I also recognize my need of God, so let us continue in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are absolutely amazing. And um, we look up to you in faith right now. But we look forward to seeing you truly in all your glory and just bowing down in amazement before you. But here we are singing your praises, though. Here we are rejoicing at the fact that you've saved us, you've redeemed us at a great price, and you care for us. There's not one detail, there's not one detail that you miss in our lives. We think you do sometimes. We, we, we look at the details and say, whoops, but not for you. Lord, you are absolutely good and just and wise in all that you do. And we are like ants running around questioning and wondering, but Lord, you are on your throne and you reign over all things. And certainly, Lord, I, I miss you. I miss seeing him here. He's the only guy who can be happy to be miserable. It's amazing, Lord, and I, I want to see him again. And so I pray that you would see fit to bring him among us again, Lord. We are here right now to, to come at your feet for you to teach, to speak to us, to guide us. We, we're going to look at this little passage knowing that it is the word of God. It is from your lips, from your heart, from your very mind to us, to teach us, to guide us, to permit us to know you a bit more. And we, we want to explore the depth of who you are right now. Just, just one little exploration, Lord. So we, we pray you would lead Lead your, your teacher, your preacher right now, in all his limit and, and humanity, and guide by your spirit. We pray, Father, that all of us would be moved and touched by these truths as if they came from God, because they do. And, and you are the God, when you speak, you create out of nothing. So we, we, we pray, Lord, that you would create sanctification and transformation and change lives through these Simple words. We recognize we can't do it. That's why we are praying right now. Be, be with the teacher as he tries to, to, as best as he can, to share these truths. We just come at your feet, Father, and we want to be in awe of you as you speak to us. And we pray all in Jesus' name. Amen. In Acts chapter 9, we meet up a disciple named Ananias. He's been given a mission by the Lord. Go down the street and street, knock at the door, and you'll meet up with Saul. And we can understand that at, at the beginning, this disciple does not really want to go. We know who Saul is and what he did. Yet the Lord gives him encouraging words. One of these words is, behold, he prays. There's something about the fact that this man is seeking God that's reassuring. When you think of the Christian life, of being born again, there's two main elements. Prayer and the word. Right? We seek to hear from God, as we're going to do right now, and then we respond by talking back to him in prayer, in praise. And the subject of prayer is all through the Bible, of course, and it's been talked about throughout the generations. People have wrote, written books on it. You surely try to do that, too. And when I, I approached that subject of prayer, I didn't want to do it without my own, with my own thinking. I wanted to really focus on men of prayer through the Bible and especially specific prayers in the Word of God. Because when you think about it, these are more than just interesting and beautiful prayers. They're literally led by the Spirit. It is God speaking through these men as they're praying. You can't get, be more inspired in prayer than those that are written down in Scripture, like Daniel and Ezra. And I would say there's one that's beyond all of them. John 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. You can't be more amazed in this moment of prayer. It will be our text, not just this morning and next week also, but hopefully in the future as well as we go through chapter 17, as we look at this incredible prayer when God spoke with God. I mean, when you think about it, from all eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has been in intimacy in a way that is beyond us, right? We're communicating in the sense, I'm speaking, you're hearing, but God has no mouth. He has no ears. There was a perfect unity in which his, there's just one will. It is God. But now, because he's incarnate, he's walking among us, 
we get to like sneak in and hear as the Son speaks to the Father. It's almost like we're sneaking into eternity itself and seeing the intimacy of the Trinity. It's incredible. It's hollow ground. We should almost remove our shoes. Please don't remove your shoes. But like I said, it is in a remarkable text that we want to look at in which the text itself, the prayer itself, can be separated in three pieces. The introduction we'll look at this morning. Then you have the main body, the intercession itself, from verse 6 to 19, which we'll break down to smaller pieces. And finally, the conclusion, verse 20 to 23. But before we even jump into the text, we want to read the passage to really be able to see the beauty of it. So I'm going to read the entirety of chapter 17. Bear with me. It is the word of God, so I think it's a good thing. Thank you. So, John 17, starting in verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence, with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the word that you gave me, and they have received them. And you have come to know in truth that I come from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scriptures may be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may know, that they may have, I mean, my joy fulfilled in them. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Thus I am not of the world. I do not speak, I do not ask that you have you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. For their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only but also for those who will believe in, in me through their word, that they, may all, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love me, even as, the, as you loved me, of them as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you've given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you've sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. I wonder, as I was reading that, 
Did you see some of the words and the ideas being repeated over and over again? I also wonder, will you focus on those first five verses that we were looking at today? Did you notice that it's put together in a chiastic structure? I'm sure you all know what it means, but permit me a little refresher course of what I mean by a chiastic structure. Basically, it's, it's from the Greek word chi, which is like an X. And the idea is what's in the beginning is connected to what at the end. And the middle is the same thing. So let me show you what I mean. In verse 1, he talks about glorify me so that I can glorify you. At the end of that little section, he says, I have glorified you, so glorify me. See, it's connected together. Glorify me so I can glorify you. I did glorify you, so glorify me. It comes together. It's what encircles the text because in the middle section, it's all about knowledge. See, God knew them so they should know him. And we're going to discover that as we move along, but don't miss that this knowledge is all focused on the glory of Christ. And that's what's so fascinating when you think about it. Jesus asking to be glorified. I mean, if I ask to be glorified, that's pretty selfish. And if I pray for myself, it's not a bad thing, but it's not intercession, it's supplication. Yet, right now, we are in the high plea prayer. Jesus is praying for himself because that's what's best for the disciples. See, God alone can be focused on his own glory, and it's what's best for us, as we will discover moving along as we start with verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, this comes from John. And John's not just giving us information. Now Jesus will pray. Thank you. No. Actually, by saying this, he's reminding us that this prayer is built off the upper room discourse a few chapters before. Something we went together through it, piece by piece, sporadically here and there. And I highly encourage you this week, take the time. Three simple chapters, 14 to 16, read them. And you will see that Jesus lays out in that discourse strands that he will pick up and knit together for the prayer that's before us. His prayer is built off what he's already talked about. One of the main strands is himself. He actually starts the, high, the, the upper room discourse by saying, as you believe in God, believe also in me. Pretty bold words. And he backs it up because me and the Father are one. Because I'm the only way to the Father. And I'm the only way by which you can approach the Father in prayer. It's all focused on Jesus. He even moves on to chapter 15, where he talks about the fact that you need to be grafted into that vine that is Jesus to bear fruit. Because if not, not only will you not bear fruit, you're going to burn. He even says that being connected to him is going to be the reason why the world hates you. It's all about Jesus. And that's what they got to preach, Jesus. That's why when he moves on to chapter 16, and talks about the coming of the Spirit, what the Spirit is going to preach is Christ. He's going to tell the world, convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But it's all focused on Jesus. Why sin? Because they don't believe in Jesus. Why righteousness? Because Jesus is the one that goes to the Father and is accepted by Him. And all those who believe in Him will also be accepted. And why judgment? Because the prince of this world, who rejected Jesus a long time ago, is already judged. And all those who decide to follow him and reject Jesus, are also already judged. Like I said, it's all focused on Christ. Just like this introduction, it's all about him. So as I said, these aren't just words to tell us what we are, it's to tell us what this prayer is all about. And as he continues, John tells us he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, here again, I have to say, it's not just words of information. I see there's two elements being presented here which will actually be shown, shown in the text. The first being that he's the son of God, right? The God-man. When he's looking up, he probably does see his father. He's the one that came from heaven. Compared to us that walk, look out by faith, he came from there. He's looking up to his father right now. And, and that's important too. He's looking up to the source that's also going to come through the text again and again. The source who is this heavenly father. That's who he addresses when he starts his prayer. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. Don't miss that present tense. The hour has come. It's now. Yet, Jesus has not been taken by the Pharisees and brought to court 
and be judged guilty of blasphemy and put on the cross. He still says, now the hour has come, but there's still things to go. How can Jesus speak in present tense if there's still things in the future to happen? As we move along, you'll see that Jesus speaks in, in the specific tenses as if things are already done, but there's still a cross to come. I believe that Jesus right now is speaking in his divinity in a sense. Give you a bit more of a, of a hint to that. If you still have your Bible open, probably don't, but that's okay. In chapter 18, right, right after, in verse 1, it tells us, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now, John stops here, but this garden is probably the Garden of Gethsemane, where Matthew and Luke and Mark tells us Jesus, in a very human sense, falls to his knees and asks that this cup not pass, pass from him. And yet, by the strength of God, he takes it up. Face like flint goes right to the cross. This happens after John 17. That's why I say he's probably praying in his divinity. Now, we want to be careful. We want to break apart Jesus. He was fully man and fully God and not bipolar. Still, in the gospel, you see hints where his humanity shows. He's hungry. He's tired. God doesn't get tired. But sometimes the divinity shows up. He can read in people's minds and hearts. Humans can do that. God can. I believe here there's a sense where right now we, are, we should be realizing that Jesus in his divinity as, as the Son of God is praying to the Father, which makes this prayer even greater than we think. Even though it is as a man, he's doing it as the Son of God. We really are watching the Son talk to the Father. It's remarkable, really. And what he's asking, again, is to be glorified, and there's a reason for it, that the Son may glorify you. It's all about the Father. Like I said, through this text, we will see that it's all about the Father, all about God, the source of all things. He even told them in the Upper Room Discourse, the Father is greater than I. You come to the Father in prayer with my name, not to me. Not saying it's wrong to pray to Jesus, but to recognize that right now Christ is focused on the source that is the Father. And it's all about glorifying Him. But this brings us to a good question, though. How? How will Christ be glorified in a way that's glorified the Father after this? Well, as you ponder that, I'll take a little sip of water. Have you got the answer? Okay, I'll give you one. I believe it's about the cross. That the main way Christ will be glorified right now in a way that's honoring the, the Father is the cross, as Paul tells us. See, he says, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by what? Triumphing over them in him. Triumph, glory, similar words. It's by the cross. See, the Romans had what they call a, a triumphant entry, a great parade for the Roman emperor when he was able to conquer another nation. And they would go in golden chariots and beautiful horses, and behind them was the conquered nation in chains, half naked. And now Paul's saying Jesus had his own triumphal entry, except not on the chariot, but being dragged behind, because God's ways are not our ways. See, God is honored by the vile, weak, and, and uh, silly things of this world. People like us. See, he's glorified by something like the cross. The very notion that this is why he was humbled and humiliated, naked in front of everybody, mocked by the religious leaders he came to rescue, rejected by all, taking the wrath of God upon himself, rejected even by the Father, is when he was glorified the most. That's God. That's what he does. So that's what Christ is asking for. Glorify me through the cross so I could glorify you through, of course, redeeming your people. And we see that because he continues in his prayer. Oops. Since you have given him authority over all flesh. And he's going to explain that this authority is to save. See, that little since is important because it explains this is how. Glorify me so I could glorify you. This is how I'm going to save people. So again, I go through the cross. This is how he wants to be glorified. 
What is shameful to man is glorious to God. What is weak to man is strength to God. That's how he's going to get glorified. Now, don't miss again the present tense, right? You have present tense. It's, it's a reality right now, giving him authority over all flesh. Well, that's weird because in Matthew 28, when he's resurrected and glorified, he's going to tell his disciples, I have all authority. So, wait, it happened then or it happened now? Is Jesus making a mistake or is he speaking two different ways? Again, is he speaking in a sense of divinity as in God sees it all as reality? It is. The future already is for God. Christ is speaking as what is, is in divinity right now. Well, later, in time and space, it will happen in this humanity. He will be given all authority. He will have this authority um, over all flesh, he says, of all humans. He has this rule over lives, over hearts and minds. God says in his own word that he used the Assyrians like a tool. Well, that's not nice, but that's God's sovereignty. See, the disciples understood that, actually. Because in Acts chapter 4, when John and Peter are, are before the religious rulers, and they're told, never speak about Jesus anymore. They go back to the disciples, and his heart they pray. And when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in the city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you've anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. They acted willingly in their evil behavior, but it was also God's predestined plan. God's hand moved their will without coercing it and accomplished his will through that. That's beautiful. And you see that little uh, uh, expression, sovereign Lord, that I highlighted in red. It isn't there, right? Okay. Uh, it's actually one word in the Greek, despatos. Um, it gives us the English word despot, tyrant. And right, right away when we respond and say, no, that's not God. Because our notion of a despot is someone who's mean and cruel and destructive, but in reality it speaks of authority over his people, complete authority, his will is done. God is that. Except he's perfectly good, perfectly just, perfectly loving and humble. But still he is the sovereign Lord. As Christ said, he has authority over all flesh. And don't miss it was given to him, again, by who? By the Father. It came from God. It came from the Heavenly Father. That's important to Jesus again and again that it's from this source. But there's a reason for this authority, though. Something he needs to do with it to give eternal life to all whom you have given me. Again, it comes from God. I don't know if you, you recognize how it, the fluidity kind of breaks apart. Because he starts by saying, you have authority over all flesh. What do you expect hearing after that? So you give eternity to all flesh, right? That kind of glows fluidly. That's the mirror image, but he doesn't. He says, all flesh, so I, I give life to all you've given me. From the entirety to a specific group. These words are echoed from Jesus himself in John 6, when he said, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And it's good to reason it backwards, right? Jesus will never cast out anyone who comes to him. But the only one who come to him is those the Father brings. See, that's important. And I know this subject of election, predestination, troubles people, frustrates people, makes debates. But there's something beautiful in what Jesus is saying, actually. Because right after, he says this. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. What hope? 
You can't lose your salvation, but not because of you. Not because you're going to persevere or you have faith. Because the Father took you up with his mighty hand. And he puts you in the hand of Jesus. And there's nobody more powerful than him. No one can take you out of there. So that's what is hope. The Father is putting together a bride from pieces all of us put together. And he's going to give this to the Son who's going to raise us up and glorification later on. No one can stop God from doing that. That's why these words should be encouraging. Oops, going too fast. When he says that it is the Father who gave him. But that subject will be touched in more detail next time, actually. Because Jesus will continue to speak about this election and this work of God to take and to give to the Son. So it's not me, it's Jesus. Not my fault. But this does bring us to that question again of what is eternal life exactly? Because Jesus wants to answer that question, actually. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus, whom you've sent. And this is interesting, again, because it kind of breaks the flow. Jesus is talking to God about being glorified. But at some point, he tells him about what is eternal life. Why does he tell God, who knows all things, what is eternal life? Does God need to be reminded of it? Or is it possible that right now he's saying this for the disciples who are hearing in? Right? One of them is actually writing it down in a sense. John, who's putting it for us. I believe right now, Jesus is breaking the fourth wall. Remember that moment in the movies and the shows where the main actor looks at the camera, he's like he knows we're watching? That's what Jesus is going on right now. He knows disciples are hearing in. He knows that they can hear what he's talking about. And he's telling them, eternal life is knowing God. Wait. You, you mean something about castle in the sky? Where I get fed from angels and I don't get fat? No, that's not eternal life. It's knowing God. See, all through the scripture, we see it over and over again and again. It's this knowledge of God that it leads us to walk with him. The book of Proverbs, for instance, speaks of that. Now, the book of Proverbs is sometimes seen as just a book of good sayings to help you out. It's more than that. Actually, when the, the, the book begins, the author, Solomon, explains to his son why wisdom is important. Because it's the beginning of, of fear before God. It is what will lead your life in this relationship with God. And then he gives practical ways to do it. But he starts by saying this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. Understand that acknowledging is not just acknowledging he exists or he's really great and, and, and moralistic and all that. It's recognizing God made this world and he set it up to work in a certain way and he told us through his word the commandments and the laws and what actually is destructive like sin. Acknowledging that, realizing that the laws and the commandments are not just rules but an expression of God's holiness and so to walk in them is to walk with God that's going to help you out. And Israel didn't understand that. That's why God later on will tell them, my people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. See, this is what we call, again, parallelism in Jewish writing, where you're repeating the same idea in two different ways. See, this idea of rejecting knowledge is the same as forgetting the law. Because again, the law is an expression of God. So to say, I know God, but I don't want anything to do with his word and his commandments. No, you don't know God. Because knowing God means knowing his law and walking according to it. And there is a time, God says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's the new Jerusalem. That's the new heaven, the new earth. That's going to be reality, knowing God. But then we should again ask a question. If that's the eternal reality, right? eternity is knowing God, what does that mean for me now? Because I'm already born again. I'm already a citizen of heaven. So what does it mean in a palpable way that eternal life is knowing God? Well, I'll let Paul tell us. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish 
as dung, as manure, in order that I may gain Christ. This is not about asceticism or monasticism or being poor. This is not about trying to make yourself suffer so then you really be spiritual. No. But it is about realizing that all these things that will make it so important to us should be seen as rubbish if they don't help us to know God. It means everything about your life, everything about your time, your free time, as much as your work time, should be about knowing God. It also means your trials, your tribulation, your suffering is about knowing God, not just stuff you have to go through and get past. All of it is ways to know God. And if they don't help you know God, it should be rubbish to you. And that's harder. I don't want to get rid of that stuff. But does it help you know God? Then why do you keep it? So with this said by Jesus, as we come back to the fact of knowing the only true God and Jesus, whom you've sent, again, Jesus was sent by the Father. Again, he's pointing back to God. It's not just knowing God, but knowing that the Father sent the Son. Because again, when Christ came, he came to reconcile us to the Father. So the Spirit regenerates us, hides us in Christ's righteousness so we can come to the Father because it's about him. Christ knew that. That's what he prayed about. And as he continues his, his prayer, he continues to speak in, in a time, a verb tense that should make it interesting for us. Because he says, I glorified, past, you on earth, having accomplished, it's already done, the work that you gave me to do. Wait, Jesus, you haven't gone to the cross yet. How can you say your work is accomplished? How can you be saying tetelestai right now? You're not at the cross yet. Because again, he's speaking in his divine way, from an eternal perspective. It's all taken care of. It will happen. Because that's the reality for God. And it's the work that God gave him. I love that. Because Christ himself said that he does nothing of himself. It's all the will of the Father. That's what he came to do. In every aspect, in every detail. So to be, uh, to have a problem, to be frustrated at the fact that God may be a great despatos, a sovereign ruler over our lives and our will, shows that there's something missing because for Christ it wasn't a problem. Because Christ knew who God was. He knew the Father. More you know who this God is and more you say, yeah, you will be done. Not mine. Not my ideas, not my ways. Your will. Even if you break mine, go ahead. It's, you know what you're doing. But again, like I said, the, present te- the past tense that he's using is really interesting because he's speaking as something that is when it's not. That's the way God is, right? He speaks about things that are before they even exist. Right after that, in the same prayer, he says, and now. And he's going to speak about the fact of being glorified with, being the, with the Father. But wait a second, Jesus. You haven't spent 40 days with the disciples yet. You can't go yet. He still says now. Because he's speaking in a divine way. He's speaking from perspective as all of it is reality. It's good for us to have that kind of perspective of things. Because we worry about the things that might be and should be and can't be, but God just sees it as is. See, the future is not some stuff that God's going to try to work and do. It just is as God has already established it. It should reassure us that. It's not about being boastful and prideful and saying, I know, Lord, you will answer my prayer this way. And I know you'll heal me that way. No, that's just boastful. But there is a sense of saying, I know you've got this, and you've already established it before I've existed. I don't have to think about the future. I just got to think about knowing you and how I'm going to know you through these next situation and the way you're going to deal with these situations and how I can discover you through that. But like I said, Jesus says, now, Father, Glorify me in your own presence, like I said, with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now that blows my mind right there because the Bible doesn't speak of that reality. It can't. The Bible is in time. God, Jesus is speaking before there was anything. So there's no hints of that in the Bible. There's a little something like in Philippians chapter 2. When Paul is saying that Jesus did not grasp to be equal to God, but he humbled himself. But he humbled himself, why? So he can save us on the earth. So he's still talking about what the world existed. But Jesus is saying something was before all of it. 
that perfect intimacy of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we could not know anything about. It just blows my mind. The reality of what Christ is saying in that simple little mention here, this little introduction. And the disciples listening in right now should also have their little minds blown as well. He's talking about something that's beyond us, but that's who God is. If God is not beyond you, you're not worshiping the right God. Because he is something that blows our mind. He is something that's so beyond the way he sees, the way he exists, the way he experiences. And that's what Jesus ends his little note on before the world existed. Before there were angels worshiping me, I want to be in that glory. Where he was just glorious, even if we didn't see it, to praise him. Angels didn't see it to praise him. He was just glorious because that's who he is. That's what we need too. Right? We need that kind of focus. This is what we're talking about when we say to know God. Not just know the stuff he does or a few attributes, but to really know a greatness of God that leaves our mind blown 24-7. That's why I can't see a better way to finish this text than by Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. When he says, for this reason... Now, that reason is what he sees in the first three chapters, right? Predestining us to be in Christ, to the praise of his glory, and how we were dead in trespasses and sins. But God, who's good and merciful, saved us in Christ. And he made us a people, Jews and Gentiles, together. For that reason, he says, I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. God has authority over all. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. And there's a reason, though, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. There's a reason for that, too. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend and to grasp with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And you see there's a comma there because there's really a break in the Greek. He's talking about one thing specifically. Who or what is this thing that has a breadth and length and height and weight that just surpasses us? It's God himself. It's remarkable to me the idea that we need the Holy Spirit and Jesus to help us grasp the greatness of God because he's just that amazing. We need the help of God to help to understand God. And he he continues, right? And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. I know Jesus loves me, but you don't know it then. There is no but to go afterwards. To know that love, it surpasses you. And all that is so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. See, it's all about God once again. That should be our prayer. That should be our focus. This is what Christ was focused on in his introduction, asking for glory so that he could give us that knowledge of this great God. May we seek it. Let us pray. Father, you are so great, so remarkable, so amazing, and our teeny tiny little brains and our little attitude of of our reality, Lord, just keeps us from seeing it, but help us. Help us to really reach out and grasp how infinitely great you are. And no matter what circumstances, what we are drowning in, what is striking us left and right, what is disturbing us or bothering us, what idols are in our lives, just remove them all, Lord, so we can reach out and grab hold of how great you are. As Christ has asked, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.